Good morning. morning. We're continuing uh, in uh, 2 Corinthians this morning, 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 8, as Paul deals with the uh, practical arrangements. Can we go back a slide? Yeah. Can I click it back? I can't click it at all at the moment, so... We're, um, Apostle Paul was struggling with PowerPoint and uh, it froze on him, but it, it, didn't, it didn't worry him. The Apostle Paul, he's working with the church at Corinth. Uh, for some time he's been preparing this gift that's going to go to the church in Jerusalem. And we're going to read from uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 8 from verse 16 as he begins to deal with some of the practical issues around this gift. So, 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 16. I thank God who put into the heart of Titus the same concern I have for you. For Titus not only welcomed our appeal, but he's coming to you with much enthusiasm and on his own initiative. And we are sending along with him the brother who is praised by all the churches for his service to the gospel. What is more, he was chosen by the churches to accompany us as we carry the offering which we administer in order to honour the Lord himself and to show our eagerness to help. We want to avoid any criticism of the way we administer this liberal gift. For we are taking pains to do what is right, not only in the eyes of the Lord, but also in the eyes of men. In addition, we are sending with them our brother, who has often proved to us in many ways that he is zealous, and now even more so because of his great confidence in you. As for Titus, he's my partner and fellow worker among you. As for our brothers, they are representatives of the churches and an honour to Christ. Therefore, show these men the proof of your love and the reason for our pride in you so that the churches can see it. There's no need for me to write to you about this service to the saints, for I know that your eagerness to help, and I've been boasting about it to the Macedonians, telling them, that since last year you and Achaia were ready to give, and your enthusiasm has stirred most of them to action. But I'm sending the brothers in order that... That sounds a bit threatening, doesn't it? I'm sending the brothers. But I'm sending the brothers in order that our boasting about you in this matter should not prove hollow, but that you may be ready as I said you would be. For if any any Macedonians come with me and find you unprepared, we, not to say anything about you would be ashamed of having been so confident. So I thought it necessary to urge the brothers to visit you in advance and finish the arrangements for the generous gift you had promised. Then it will be ready as a generous gift, not as one grudgingly given. So on first reading through this, you kind of ask the question, well, you know, why has the Holy Spirit preserved these kind of practical arrangements for this gift? Last week we um, simply took what Paul had written 2,000 years ago and we applied it, we drew out some of the principles and we applied it to our lives today. But this week's, well, it's kind of more like who's going to do what, when and how and why. Why has the Holy Spirit preserved this? Uh, You know, wouldn't it make more sense just to move on to a more interesting passage? In 10 minutes' time you might wish I had. Well, we're going to persevere with it anyway. Actually, I think what this week's passage might be worth trying to reboot the thing. You might wish I... No, anyway. What this week's passage does, I think, it helps us to step back from the immediate and look at the bigger picture. And what it reveals to us is something of the nature of the church. Because interestingly, these these two chapters, uh, 2 Corinthians uh, 8 and 9, they are not the... New Testament's only uh, input about this gift to the church in Jerusalem. As we noted last week in 1 Corinthians, Paul mentions that uh, he's spoken to the Galatian churches about this. We also saw last week that uh, to the Romans, Paul also writes about this gift. Actually, there had already been a gift to the church in Jerusalem, a smaller gift from one church. This is a much bigger gift. It takes Paul's years to organise it. It's an, almost, it's an enormous effort. Almost certainly, Paul delivered this gift to the church at Rome on his last and fateful visit to the church in Jerusalem. 
I say almost certainly because all the timings stack up. And actually, when you look at the circumstances going around, like the letters that were written at this time and all that kind of stuff, and other, as we'll see, other bits of information, it, it's almost certain that in that last visit, Paul, lovely, thank you very much. Paul, uh, that was his last journey, kind of goes all the way around the Med, and he ends up in Jerusalem. And this last visit that he makes to Jerusalem... As I say, all the evidence stacks up that that's what he was doing. But the interesting thing is, if you know Acts, Luke, who wrote Acts, never mentions this gift. That was the purpose of the journey. Why doesn't he mention it? Well, of course, nobody knows. There's lots of speculation. But perhaps, perhaps the church in Jerusalem wouldn't accept it. Because actually when you read Acts 21 and this description of the way the church in Jerusalem has developed, it has become very, very Jewish. It seems to have slipped back actually into, well actually it describes them as being very zealous for the Old Testament law. And maybe, maybe a gift from the Gentiles was not acceptable. Some of you will know the name F.F. Bruce. F.F. Bruce was a, a New Testament scholar and uh, you could not accuse F.F. F. Bruce of being kind of reactionary or going off on flights of fancy. If you read any of his work, it's stuff. But in 1964, and again, this is not a reactionary journal, in the Christian Brethren Research Fellowship Journal, okay, that's not going to be reactionary stuff. Uh, he wrote an article, and in it he says, he writes about the four things that went wrong in Jerusalem in the church in Jerusalem. And it may be, and certainly Paul and his companions are warmly welcomed by the leaders, but the leaders are also quite disturbed by the presence of Paul in the church because there are all kinds of rumours going around the church about what Paul is up to. And so it may be, who knows quite why, but it's interesting that Luke never mentions it. But whatever happened to the gift... Whether it was received or not, what we do know is that travelling with Paul were representatives of a huge range of churches. And so in Acts 20, verse 4, um, and I'll need to read that because I haven't got my telescope to read that screen up there. But in Acts 20, oh no, I've got it in my notes, it's all right. Acts 20, verse 4, it says, Paul was accompanied by Sopater, son of Pyrrhus from Berea, Aristarchus, that's been the source of various jokes, hasn't it? First Greek streaker and all that. Aristarchus, and <laughs> stick with it. And Secundus from Thessalonica, Gaius from Derby, Timothy also, and Tychicus, and Trophimus from the province of Asia. Philippi, church at Philippi isn't mentioned, but Luke is there. And it may well be that Luke is representing the church at Philippi. Corinth isn't mentioned. Maybe Paul is representing Corinth. But when you look on the map... That's the spread of the churches. And in fact, two of those churches are representing geographical regions, the region of Asia and the region of Galatia. That's a huge spread of churches, isn't it? You know, we say we live in a global village. This is 2,000 years ago, when travel and communication was so much harder. Something extraordinary is going on here, that Paul has got all these churches organised. Whatever happened to the gift... What we see here is a much broader principle at work, and we see something about the nature of the church, which if we're not careful, we lose sight of. The nature of the early church, quite clearly in this passage, quite clearly in what is going on in here, quite clearly in the New Testament as a whole, the New Testament, passage, uh, New Testament church, one of the factors about them was that they shared resources between the churches. In particular, they shared churches, but a uh, church, church, they church. They shared people between the different churches. You see that very clearly in this passage. There are quite a lot of people involved in this enterprise. And quite obviously, Paul is quite cautious about this. And that's why there are different people involved. Verse 20 of chapter 8. We want to avoid any criticism of the way we administer this liberal gift. For we're taking pains to do what's right. Not only in the eyes of the Lord, but also in the eyes of men. Paul is being very careful that there is no suggestion that he gains in any way financially from this gift. 
or that there is any kind of financial chicanery going on. So he involves a broad range of people in the delivery of this gift. But the way in which the two unnamed men are mentioned in this passage makes it clear, as other parts of the New Testament do as well, that people are shared widely between these different churches, even though they can't get on an aeroplane to do it. They have to either get on a boat or a donkey or walk or whatever. And uh, Titus is mentioned here, but you'd expect that Titus is one of Paul's men. He's part of his team. He describes him, doesn't he, as his, as his partner and a fellow worker. But then there are two mystery men in this passage. Now, for some reason, these are obviously men who are known in Corinth. Paul never names them. Why? We don't know. But mystery man number one, you read about in verses 18 and 19. We are sending along with him the brother who is praised by all the churches for his service to the gospel. Sounds like this man is an evangelist. And actually, if he's going to go into Corinth, the thing about evangelists is they don't have days off. Have you noticed that? Have you noticed that about evangelists? You know, even when they have a day off, they find somebody to tell about Jesus. It's just kind of in their DNA. They can't help it. So if this bloke's going to be in Corinth, chances are he's going to wander around the marketplace and do a bit of evangelism. Praised by all the churches for his service in the gospel. Notice he's not just known by one local church. He's known by all the churches. What is more, he was chosen by the churches to accompany us as we carry the offering and so on. This is a man with a proven track record, known just, not just in one church, but in a number of churches. And also, interestingly, the verb that suggests he was picked suggests a vote, a hand vote, okay, by more than one church which again talks about the interconnection between these different churches. It also ensures that this is not Paul's man. He's been chosen by the churches, not Paul. Again, Paul keeps clear of the money. Mystery man number two, verse 22, is often proved to us in many ways that he is zealous. He's got a proven track record. He has confidence in you. That's another way of saying he wants you to succeed. Whoever these men were, they are already known in Corinth but they're not based in Corinth. They come from other churches. People are being shared between the churches. The church in Corinth is a collection of different house churches. Quite how those churches interconnected, again, we don't know. But the sharing of resources goes on. You see, we see something here about the nature of the church that all too easily we lose sight of. Yes, Local churches are rooted in a local context, but they're part of something much bigger. And actually, they're not just part of that in word, they're part of that in action, in the way in which they share resources together. And we as a local church do this. Have you noticed it? We share people. There are people who regularly input from outside into the life of this church. One of them is our regional minister, and he does that not because he's a regional minister, although in part he does it because he's a regional minister, Richard Lewis, but he also does it because he's our friend. And he has been very helpful to us as a church, as we shall see in a moment. And then there's Roy Searle, who doesn't come to us in any kind of official capacity. He'll be here again in October the 12th and the 13th. We'll be doing some stuff on the Saturday morning with him on the Saturday evening as the Portuguese-speaking congregation have their anniversary service. So we'll be invited there to enjoy their brand of worship. And uh, Roy will be speaking by translation there. He'll be exploring with us alone together, taking risks, the challenge, opportunity, and adventure of living missionally. Richard Lewis kind of comes from within the Baptist hierarchy, for want of a better word. He wouldn't thank me for saying that. Roy Searle comes from outside that, but actually... He has a broader picture of what's going on in this nation. And he is helping us work out together what it is to be a missional church. We receive from others on a regular basis. Do we give anything back? Actually, you may have forgotten this, but to the appointment of Georges as our associate minister is a partnership arrangement. He is not exclusively ours. He never will be because he's his own man. But you see, we work in a partnership with the 
American Baptist Congress, the Brazilian Baptist, and the Eastern Baptist Association here because we're in a partnership. It brings us the benefit of Georges working with us, but it also means that for some of the time, Georges is also released on a wider basis. So don't forget that Georges also has responsibility for encouraging the work amongst Portuguese-speaking migrants in this region. So that means from time to time he meets with leaders of those churches and encourages them. It means also that if there is another Baptist church or a Baptistic church in this region who is looking at starting work amongst Portuguese-speaking migrants, George is the man who will go and... He won't plant the church very clearly, but he will provide advice and encouragement. Begin to see the ways in which in the early church they were interconnected. Can you begin to say the ways, see the ways that we are as well as a local church? That's already going on. But how far as a church are we prepared to push that? See, during this term, we will be relaunching our cell groups under a different name. But just imagine that a couple of our cell group leaders, or whatever the new name is, group leaders, imagine they become really proficient at this. They become really good at leading these kind of groups. Not just leading them, but multiplying them. Would we be prepared to lend those two people out, say for a year, to another local church to help them develop small groups? Because that's the kind of thing that's going on here. The sharing of people resources. And it's right at the heart of what it is to be the church. They don't only share people, but they also share finance. They share money. I mean, money and people are two of the most precious resources we can have, aren't they? And yet these things are shared between the churches over a huge area. As a local church, are we prepared to do that? Actually, we already do it. We do it on a personal level, and we also do it as a church. I mean, we support the Baptist Missionary Society. We regularly give to that. And through that, we are connected with Paul and Ruth Roach in Afghanistan and uh, we'll be supporting other aspects of their work through the Harvest Appeal and so forth. Um, We're also connected, obviously, with the Baptist Union. This is just to show you how up-to-date I am, because I think it was on Friday when they launched this new logo. You're supposed to gasp now in wonder. Um, It's purely by accident that I picked up on it, actually, but that's another story. But you see... We give regularly, as a church, to Home Mission Fund. That's not some kind of administrative thing. That actually enables the planting of new congregations in this country. And where there is a strategic opportunity for us to plant a church in this country, there is not a congregation there ready who can pay for a full-time worker. Actually, what the Home Mission Fund allows is for that to happen in advance. There are also places in this country where local churches will never be able to afford to employ anybody. They're like the Jerusalem of our day. Many of the inner city areas, actually, the bigger the church gets, the more finances they need from outside to meet the needs and the opportunities. And actually, Home Mission Fund enables that church to employ an evangelist or a community worker, or if they're really desperate, a minister to actually help that church in the most desperate... And we're part of that. We do that regularly. But I wonder, how far are we prepared to push that as a church? You know, to invest in things which actually we will get no benefit from. In this example in the New Testament, the Macedonian churches are giving away money that they could have, de- they could have done with, not, that they could have, not so much so they can have a nice church life, but actually so they could eat. They are giving away money that they can scarcely afford to do. You know, there is a danger. Last week we talked about tithing. There is a danger, as a local church, that we're faithful in tithing, but when we analyse it, listen carefully, when we analyse it, we discover we're tithing to ourselves. Because we can give money to the church, actually, and then we spend the money really to benefit ourselves that we have a nice warm room to meet in, 
that we have a range of programs that meets our needs. If we're not careful, actually, we discover we are tithing to ourselves. We need to watch that. But you see, these New Testament churches, do you hear what I'm saying? Thank you. These New Testament churches, they give away to other churches their most precious resources, people and money. And then what they also do, they have this shared sense of responsibility. You know, we see that in the number of churches involved in this whole enterprise. As a local church, we quite rightly think about and pray about, don't we, dear and the villages. Don't know where that phrase came from, but it's quite a helpful one, isn't it? You know, I hear various of us using it. That's our patch. It's what God has given us responsibility for, and that's quite right that we focus upon that. We've also got the privilege of working with other churches in the town. And uh, there's a growing momentum there. Do you know, we're incredibly fortunate, aren't we? I mean, we're only a little town, really. We're only a small number of churches, or small numbers in the churches. We've had incredible opportunities in the last few years, haven't we? You know, the turning on of the lights. Where we get, where we, with the permission of the town council, we're invited, don't dumb down the Christmas message. You know, what we did for the Queen's Jubilee. Extraordinary opportunities. And that's come about actually because, you know, as, a, as an interested observer, God has moved the pieces around in churches together that enables us, I'm not going to go into why, because I'd be breaking confidences, but God has moved the pieces around to enable us to work much more closely together. And there is a growing momentum to that, isn't there? You know, again, as a small town, food bank. As a small town, street passers or Norfolk Street Partnership, as it is these days. You know, there's some good things going on. But, I wonder, are we prepared to invest in those things in such a way that actually when it doesn't benefit us as a local church, We don't mind, because we're investing in the kingdom of God. What do they say about Deerham? What do they say about Deerham? What they say about Deerham is, Deerham is what? Heart of Norfolk. It's interesting, isn't it? You know, it's on some of the the signs, isn't it, as you drive into Deerham. I don't tend to notice them, because I know I'm driving into Deerham, but I think that's what it says underneath, doesn't it? The heart of Norfolk. It's certainly on our town council's kind of little strap line on their website. Apparently the exact, if you want a piece of useless information, this is this morning's bit of useless information. Do you know where the exact geographical centre of Norfolk is? You knew that anyway. Oh dear. Tesco's car park apparently. I'm not suggesting Tesco's is the heart of Norfolk. God forbid. We're in a strategic... We're in a strategic place, aren't we? The heart of Norfolk. I don't think that's an accident. And when you look at our history as a town, you can often see the spiritual significance in what's happened naturally. How was our town born? Through a missionary nun, St. Withberger. That's a good foundation for a town, isn't it? Roy Searles said to me, when I told him that story, he got really excited because, of course, he's really into all that Celtic missionary stuff. But he said also, he said, do you know how lucky you are in Deerham? He said, because many towns are founded on horrible things. You're built on something really good. And the other interesting thing about our history, which I've mentioned before but I remind you of, is that during the town's industrial past, things were made in Deerham that ended up all over the country, didn't they? So as you went around the country, you could see things that were made in Deerham, lorry trailers, clocks, furniture, whatever hobbies made. (laughs) Because it was a vast range of things, wasn't it? I think that's significant. See, things made in Deerham, things that happen in Deerham get transported out. We're not a big church. But you know, as I look around this morning, we're a very gifted church. As I look around this morning, we're a very experienced church. If I can be very rude to you, 
old oak trees produce lots of acorns. You know, I've said this many times, but I say it again. The last bit of our lives can be the most fruitful. And in your lives, many of you, God has stored up really good things. And he wants to release it. He wants to release it. Not so we can have a nice time in here. We've had a good time this morning, haven't we? In the sense of God, in the worship, and just the response of our hearts. But we don't just want it in here, do we? And God, I believe, is calling us as a local church not just to have an impact in Deerham in the villages, but actually in the county. Not so that the name of Deerham Baptist Church has any predominance at all, but actually so that the name of Jesus is honoured and loved in Norfolk. Amen? Amen? So we need to do that secretly and quietly. And not in our name but in the name of Jesus. A couple of years ago, God showed me a a verse in uh, Isaiah that I think describes what's going on in Deer and Baptist Church. Just listen to this. It was a sign for Hezekiah. You might wonder where I'm going with this. This year... You will eat what grows by itself, and the second year what springs from that. It's about harvest. God says to Hezekiah, in the next couple of years, you're just the harvest is just going to be what grows by itself. And I sense that God was saying to me about this church that there would be a period where we would just see that kind of natural growth. We would see some conversions, and we would see people join the church. That would be the harvest for a period. And then, but in the third year, sow and reap, plant vineyards and eat their fruit. That's a different magnitude, isn't it? That's not just what grows by itself. That's sowing and reaping, plant vineyards and eat their fruit. And I sense that we're on the edge, maybe a year, maybe two years, maybe quicker, but we're on the edge of that next phase. We're certainly doing that, aren't we, through Little Fishes Sunday. We're doing it by through some of the other things that we're doing. But actually, that it's not just natural growth, but there's a multiplication of that kind of growth going on. The next thing is that they inspired and encouraged one another. There's a famous piece on the Bayeux Tapestry. Remember that? 1066 and all that. And I can't remember whether it refers to... um, King Harold, or whether it's William, but of one of them it says, let's say it was King Harold. King Harold encourages his soldiers. And the way, and that sounds nice, doesn't it? King Harold with his arm around his soldiers. No, what it shows is King Harold, Harold, Harold? King Harold with a sharp implement up their backsides. He's encouraging his soldiers. They don't like it up them, Captain Manorah. <laughs> You see, encouragement works in various ways, doesn't it? Whoever wrote Hebrews writes to the Hebrews, spur one another on. That's a bit of a sharp, if you know what a spur is. Actually, what it means is incite one another. And actually, that's what Paul is doing between these churches in Macedonia and Achaia, isn't he? To start with, he goes to Macedonia and says, hey, in Achaia, they're really getting ready. They're getting organised. They're getting their money together. And then when Macedonia starts kicking off, he's going back, and that's what we're reading here, isn't it? He's going back to Achaia, and basically he's saying, hey, Corinth, have you heard? Have you heard, Corinth? Down in in Macedonia, they're falling over themselves to give us money. How's your collection doing? He's using the churches, not out of envy, but to spur one another on. I wonder if we're in that kind of relationship with any other church. Not out of envy, but to spur one another on. Actually, one of our congregations, one of the congregations of this church, can act like that for us, our Saturday night congregation. They come from a very different culture. They do things differently. And we can either be threatened by that, or they can spur us on. Because there are things we can learn from the way they do things. 
Notice these three things, or four things, are at variance with one of the sacred cows of the way we tend to think about the church. Because one of the sacred cows that, taken in isolation, leads us into trouble is the independence of the local church. And it's a prized thing. What it means is that there is nobody outside this church coming along. Uh, there is nobody will come along from the hierarchy at our church meeting on Tuesday night and say to us, you don't do it that way, you must do it this way. We don't have anybody outside. We work together because we believe that the local church has the right, if I can use that phrase, under the Holy Spirit to decide the right way forward. But in the New Testament, the independence of the local church is not the only thing. There is also a living relationship with other churches. Independence is not the whole story. You need both. That's what we see in this passage. I finish with this illustration, if I can get it right. A few years ago, I was at the, the mainstream conference, which is the kind of conference of the charismatic evangelical end of the Baptist Union. And we had a speaker who didn't, he didn't come from a Baptist church. He came from one of the house church networks. And he said, you know, one of the differences I observe between the house church networks and the Baptist churches is that we are very small networks. When you look at our numbers, we're much smaller than you. But we punch above our weight. Nationally, we're much more significant than the Baptist Union is, or Baptist churches are. We're much more, and that was true. And he said the difference is, the reason we punch above our weight is that we work together. And actually, if you look at some of these much smaller numeric, numerically, numerically, numerically house church movements, they punch above their weight because of the way in which they work together. Now, I'm not talking about us just working with Baptist churches. But actually, it's time the church in this country punched above our weight, isn't it? And we can punch above our weight by realizing, by going back to our roots. If these small, and they were small, little local churches could work together across the whole Mediterranean 2,000 years ago, think we can look to work with others, can't we? Amen? Amen? It's at the heart of what it is to be the church. And God has got good things for us as a local church, but we need not to hold on to those good things, but we need to be willing to share them, to release them, to see that kingdom value of multiplication released to secretly and not knowingly to other churches to be blessing what God is doing in other places, not for our glory, but for the glory of Jesus. Amen?